Hey everybody, it's Vault Box. Welcome back to my channel and to another episode of Vault Box Steals Content. Okay, obviously I'm kidding. YouTube is for learning and trying new things out. But I do realize if you've come to my channel and you've only just subscribed that I've been doing a lot of channels based off of Uncle Jesse's hacks that he's been putting out lately. And let me just say it's because I'm working on a commission that is kind of under a little bit of a time crunch. So any way that I can potentially save time in finishing my 3D prints, I'm going to try it out. And honestly, I thought I knew what I was going to do this past week. It was going to be about my experiences doing that UV resin method that I did last week. By the way, thank you guys so much for the response on that video. I've got a lot of new subscribers from that as well as a lot of views from that. I really appreciate it. You guys are awesome. Really glad that it's like resonating with some of you guys to realize like, yeah, we can actually use this resin for other things. Like I had no idea. So I'm sitting there with my morning coffee, like with my dog snuggle next to me and I'm getting ready to basically script out this week's video. And lo and behold, there's Uncle Jesse yet again with another video in my subscription feed about using baby powder and resin to create a Bondo like paste to fill in gaps in your 3D prints. And I was like, well, what do you know? Because I was working on this book Catan commission and I had basically ripped off a couple of layers of filament because I was too hard with my palm sander or whatever. I ended up making more work for myself. And that tends to happen if you're printing at a higher layer height. I printed this at 0.28 millimeter layer height and I guess I was just going too hard with too low of a grid of sandpaper at once and it just created this huge gash on it. So what I normally would do in those situations is I would actually use the Bondo in a can. So the can and the hardener two-part mixture because that for me is a lot better for filling in deep gaps like that. The stuff in the tube is more so for building up multiple layers and filling in small hairline cracks and things like that. However, I couldn't find my cream hardener. I don't know where it is. It's probably, if I had to guess, it's probably sucked up in my shop back and I might check that right after this video. So I went on to Amazon and I ordered the cream hardener really without looking at the shipping time. It's going to get here on Tuesday and as I'm filming this video, it is now Monday. So whenever I was doing everything for this video, it was Sunday. So keep in mind that this would have been two days elapsed of me getting no work done on this helmet that again, I'm on a time crunch with. And yes, I know I could have gone to the auto parts store and just gotten some of that hardener without having to wait for shipping times. But again, we are still in this thing called a Panera. And I just kind of got a little bit giddy about trying to make something out of stuff that I already had and not having to waste money on that. So like I said, I've been using the UV resin coating trick from last week's video on this Bo-Katan helmet I'm working on for a commission. And it's been going great and it's really cut down on the amount of post-processing work I've had to do. I'll say it's a direct comparison to the Bondo in a tube and filler primer method that I typically use and I'll link that video for you guys up above. I would say that one coating of the UV resin on a raw 3D printed helmet is about equal to three layers of the Bondo and filler priming for me. And again, this is just personal experience. I tend to put on really thin layers of Bondo. I know some people like to glob it on thick and all that stuff, but from my experience, one layer of the UV resin will typically equal three layers of the Bondo and filler primer. The only problem I'm having at the moment with this method is figuring out a good way of curing such large pieces. What I did for this particular helmet is I gave it a thin coating of the UV resin and I let it sit underneath my UV lamp that I kind of jerry-rigged onto my table for, to shine from above and I let it cure under there for four hours on like each quadrant of the helmet and I had to move this manually so you can imagine there was times where I almost forgot to do it. I set timers on my Apple watch and but it just it really isn't efficient. You really kind of want to automate the curing process and I just didn't have that with this specific lamp. I've read about people making their own UV chambers with steel pots, garbage cans, and even aluminum foil lined boxes with UV LED lights and to be honest that's probably what I'm going to eventually do later on I have the UV lights with me I just haven't gotten the time to just sit down and make it because I'm lazy but it ended up working out and I want to say that in total I had this curing for 16 hours again that's probably overkill but I'm more so leaning on the side of over curing my resin as opposed to under curing it if you have under cured resin or not cured resin at all it ends up being a much bigger problem than having it overcooked <laughs> If you're still not sure about how long to let your pieces cure, you could do something that I did this past time and take the little cup that you poured your resin into and just put it underneath your UV lamp as well. And it'll kind of give you a good reference of whenever the resin is finished curing. If you see here, I've got this resin right here and it is, it is cured solid. And this is about, I mean, I don't even know, like a quarter of an inch here. And since this is all cured, I know that the resin that was on my helmet is completely cured as well. So that's just one tip. I know people tend to do this with silicone, like they'll let their silicone sit in the cup and whenever you can pull it away from the cup, they know their silicone's cured. So kind of the same thing you can do with your resin. And another tip, you should never throw away uncured resin. So if for some reason you don't want to pour your resin back into the bottle, I don't know why you wouldn't, you're going to want to make sure that this is cured before you throw it away. And you can't recycle this. So just be cognizant of how 
how much of this you're throwing away. So just don't try to be wasteful. Like I really should have poured a little bit of this back into my bottle before I cured it to make sure it was fine, but you live and you learn. Another tip, I feel like this is going to be both a tutorial on how to do this paste method, as well as some of my like trial and error issues with using the UV light. The wattage of your UV light matters. I'm honestly not sure what the, what the wattage of this one that I have right here is. Probably put it on the screen here for you guys, just so you know, but I ended up getting some LED lights that are 60 watt UV LED lights. Is that a little bit overkill? Probably, but just keep in mind, even if your UV light is two watt, it's still going to be able to cure your piece. It's just going to take a lot longer time than say a 40 watt LED or a 60 watt LED. And again, that's kind of why I have to give the caveat of saying it's going to be trial and error because you may have a different UV light than I do. Again, I hate to keep falling back on that terminology because I know people hate to say that. I can tell you what I've done and you can try those out. And if they don't work for you and you have to adjust some numbers, then that's totally fine. Just make sure you remember it for next time. Anyways, now that I'm all done letting you know of my experience, Experience using this UV resin for the past week. Let's get on to the actual meat of this tutorial and probably why you clicked on this video. I'm going to show you how to use baby powder and UV resin to make a paste to fill in all your big old scratches and dents on your 3D prints. Let's go. First off, you'll need all of your safety supplies that I laid out in the first video. You'll need a respirator that has filters that are rated for resin fumes, gloves, and some eye protection if you have them. Make sure to kick your pets out of the room and work in a well-ventilated area. Next, you'll need your resin, a disposable cup to pour it in, some popsicle sticks for stirring, or in my case, I just ended up using the butt end of a foam stick, a silicone mat or some other protective covering for your workspace, some baby powder, and then finally, some chip brushes, or in my case, I'm trying out these silicone tip makeup brushes to apply the paste on your print with. Next thing you'll want to do is just take your disposable cup, pour in your UV resin, and then start to kind of squirt, spray, or whatever you call this is with the baby powder into the cup. And you're going to mix it until you get a thick paste-like consistency. It's supposed to be a one-to-one -one mixture, but to be honest with you, that really didn't even mean anything to me because I had to do this by feel. I kept stirring in more and more of the baby powder until the resin mixture didn't drip off of my popsicle stick and look sort of like this does. Once I had the paste, I took one of my silicone makeup brushes and brushed it into the gap around the dome, trying to get it in as smooth of a layer as I could, but I did end up using my fingers to smooth it down just a little bit further. But just be careful if you're going to do this because I ended up flinging some of the mixture onto my bare wrists and I had to basically rush out of the room and wash it all off. And just a tip, you're going to be sanding this down later, so even if you don't get a super smooth coverage, you'll be fine later, trust me. I then took my helmet and set it underneath my UV lamp for about an hour and took it out to my garage for some sanding with my mouse sander. Again, this curing was probably overkill and I probably could have gotten away with with just curing this for like 10 minutes or something like that. But again, I'm playing it more on the safe side of letting it cure for a little bit longer than I think it needs to just to be safe. I started to sand it down with 240 grit at first and then I noticed it really wasn't working as well as I wanted it to. So I switched down to a 120 grit, which ended up doing a much better job for me. The one issue I was running into, and I've run into this with Bondo as well because it's just typical of sanding, this is what's gonna happen. It would gum up my sandpaper really quickly. So I would constantly have to be washing it out and stuff. Again, it happens with Bondo too. So it's just something to keep an eye on and if you ever feel like it's not sanding as well as it should be take a look at it it's probably gummed up and you probably need to clean it out i ended up filling in that gap around the dome and some other more prominent layer lines that i saw and after they were sanded down this is how it looked you can see there's still a few small nicks and things here but once i put on another layer of filler primer they were already starting to disappear i feel like a lot of people are going to wonder if using this paste is better than doing the thin layer of resin trick that i showed last week and if i'm being honest after sanding these spots down i would really only recommend using this paste for gap and things that you really need to cover up like my mess here on the dome. It's very efficient in filling in gaps and holes, but I feel like if I had to sand my entire helmet down with this paste, I would go crazy. The benefit of this paste is that it's extremely durable in a way that the Bondo spot putty slash the Bondo in a can is not. When I sand down those products, it's really easy for me to go too hard and sand in dents that I didn't mean to. Whereas with this paste, it's a lot easier to just get a really smooth finish that really only tends to sink into the gaps, if that makes any sense. <laughs> so yeah, one of Another hack that I can totally see myself using in the future and I already have used because I just made a video on it. <laughs> <laughs> One thing to note, whenever I put on the first layer of filler primer, so like there were some spots around here and on the dome, whenever I put the filler primer on top, you could see like distinctly where it was. And I'm not talking like it was standing up because it's thicker there, but whenever I put on the second coat of filler primer, it evened everything out. So if you do notice that after you put on the first coat of filler primer over that UV paste, don't be alarmed. You can still cover it up with the next layer of filler primer. <laughs> Trust me, I was alarmed. <laughs> Anyways, guys, thank you so much for watching. I would love to hear what your thoughts are on this. If you're thinking about trying it out, if you think that this is absolutely ridiculous and why don't you just go out and get some bondo in a can and as always i will see you guys next time bye you like my new setup 
I had to clean, so I hope you like it. <coughs> my throat hurts. Oh my god. So normal people put up curtains on their windows whenever they try to block out light when they're filming in the day. I just put blankets up there. No, Siri, no. Speaking of like stealing content, which it really wasn't stealing content, does anybody remember like back in the old days of YouTube where people would make a video and then people would actually do responses to that video? Like I'm not talking like making a separate video like I'm doing here explaining how I do my method, but you know, an actual legitimate like reply to that video. It was like, it was like a thing. I don't even remember how it worked or why they took it away. I mean, they probably took it away because someone abused it. Oh yeah. 